Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another FJMC Sports Affinity. We are super, super excited about tonight's guest, Elisa Kanner from the Jewish Federation of Greater Boston and also a New England Patriots cheerleader. So uh, this is outstanding. Um, we are, I can't even tell you how excited we are. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I am Danny Mando. I'm co-chair of the Sports Affinity. And I am now going to introduce you to my partner, the man who was responsible for our guest tonight, David Kravitz. David, take it away. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Well, we have a good one for you tonight. And hello and welcome to the Sports Affinity Webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 250 conservative men's clubs members yeah. around the world. Brings value and adds meaning to the lives of men and their families. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mando. We are the co-chairs of Sports Affinity. We'll be hosting tonight. We'll mute everyone so we can enjoy the presenter's remarks so we can take questions in the chat. It's now my pleasure to introduce Eliza Kanner. Eliza is a University of Connecticut graduate with a degree in journalism. She's a senior development officer at the Combined Jewish Philanthropies and has worked extensively to fight anti-Semitism and counter anti-Israel rhetoric, primarily on college campuses across North America. With a background in Israel education, she has previously worked with Stand With Us as a campus educator and has met with international leaders at the United Nations to speak on the dangers of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Eliza is a three-season veteran New England Patriot cheerleader and a Miss Connecticut. She is an ambassador of Mr. Robert Kraft's Stand Up to Jewish Hate initiative. Eliza Passion is advocating for young people to be proud of their Jewish identity. And now it's my pleasure to have Eliza speak. Thank you so much, David, for that wonderful introduction. And to Danny and the entire leadership for bringing me here tonight. It's truly a pleasure to be able to speak to audiences far and wide across the United States. And it's a privilege to be here with you all tonight. So thank you all so much for joining. And I hope that you all had a- And before you start- And eight Hanukkah. Please, before you start, we don't Oh, can you repeat yourself? If you have a question, Lisa, please put it in the chat. She'll either take the question directly or we'll ask it after her presentation. And please, 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 everyone stay on mute. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you so much. So thank you again for the introduction, David, and thank you for bringing me here tonight. I'm going to be sharing a bit about who I am, how I got to this career and found a career building upon my passion of being a proud Jewish woman, being a proud Israel educator, and how I've been able to utilize my platforms as a former Miss Connecticut in the Miss America organization, as well as a three-season New England Patriots cheerleader to be able to empower other people to be proud of their Jewish identity as well. So I grew up in Hamden, Connecticut. It's a small suburban town next to New Haven. And I link my pride, my Jewish pride back to this community. My parents from a very young age instilled Jewish values in my siblings and I and taught us the importance of being proud of where we come from and the stories from our from our Jewish community that make up who we are today. And so my Jewish community was really something that I leaned on. And so many of our family friends came from Temple Beth Shalom in Hamden, Connecticut. Many of my close friends growing up were the, the, my peers in Hebrew school with me. We attended each other's bar and bar mitzvahs. And so it was really just an element of something that I never had to think about. I never had to think about the choices I was making in order to be a part of the Jewish community. And it was always something that was really important to my family and brought me into a space where when I went to the University of Connecticut, it was the first community that I wanted to seek out. So on my very first Friday night at the University of Connecticut, I attended a Shabbat dinner at Hillel. And so I was one of those students where I didn't need 
you know, my parents to tell me that I should go to Hillel. I didn't need, you know, an older, an older peer to bring me to Hillel. I wanted to seek out that community. And so I was so fortunate that I ended up at that Shabbat dinner on the first Friday night at UConn, because that really was the start of my journey in, in this work and in this space as an Israel educator. So on that first Friday night Shabbat, I met the Israel Fellow that was on our campus. And for many campuses, they have an Israel Fellow sent to numerous campuses across North America. And the goal of this, this uh, role on campus is to bring a taste of Israel to campus. And so he and I got talking and he was he asked me what I was interested, what I wanted to uh, pursue in my academic career. And he said, we're going to make something of you. So in the first couple weeks on campus, I started getting engaged in the Jewish life on campus, both within the Hillel, but then also through other student groups and found that this was a space I really um you know, I really want to grow as a leader. Simultaneously, I was also on the Yukon dance team. And actually, David's granddaughter and I were on the team together. And that was a space where I was actually challenged as a Jewish individual. Dania, David, I'm not even sure if Becca ever told you this story. But in our first couple of weeks, um, of course, we had the high holidays. And we um, you know, we had practice multiple times a week and we had a practice scheduled on the day of Yom Kippur. So during Yom Kippur, while uh, many of my uh, teammates and I were fasting, there were about four other Jewish uh, dance team members during that year. We were fasting. And so earlier that week, we went to our coach and we explained that we'd be fasting for Yom Kippur and asked if there was any way that we would be able to be excused from practice that evening. And she said that if we missed practice, that we wouldn't be able to cheer at that following Saturday football game. And Quite frankly, I didn't have the skills, the resources, nor the confidence to do anything about it. And so I carried on. We went to practice that night. We went to a dorm, uh, a dining hall in a dorm near practice to do break the fast together. And that was that. And looking back, that's also a moment where I know that I, I didn't have the resources quite yet. I didn't know that I had this strength within me. And I hope that there's a change for all athletes, whether they're uh, Jewish or not, to be able to find their voice. And that's really what propels the work I'm doing. The next year, I also had a moment on campus that truly propelled me into my career. So after going on Birthright, which is the 10-day experience in Israel for all Jewish young adults to be able to experience Israel in a way like no other, I traveled with 39 of my peers from the University of Connecticut, and it was that first exposure that really made me realize that I needed to bring back this experience, what I was seeing, what I was feeling, um, and bring it back and, and be able to share with my Yukon community what that real Israel was all about. I was also studying journalism at that time, so I was trying to figure out how I could take this newfound love for Israel, even though I always, I always knew I had a love for Israel, but now actually feeling it and experiencing it. I wanted to explore how I could utilize my studies as a journalist and be able to share about the real Israel. And of course, as we're seeing right now, even more so is that the media oftentimes portrays Israel in a negative light. And so I wanted to be the person, be that journalist that was going to truly change the script. So as I was getting more involved in learning about Israel and figuring out how I could learn to educate others, I was getting involved in Middle Eastern studies. So I was taking a number of classes in the Middle East uh, studies department. And one particular course I took was in the fall semester of my sophomore year called the Modern Middle East. And so this course was supposed to give us a, a bird's eye view of the current state of the Middle East, of course, diving in to some historical components. But overall, it was what is the what is the makeup of the Middle East today? And so in the first two weeks of the, the course, my professor had a map um, of 
the modern Middle East. And that was the, the title of the map. And so it was a lecture hall of about 100 students. And she's she has the map uh, pulled down and she's going through, she's naming the countries on the map. And so while she's pointing, she's saying, this is Lebanon, this is Syria, this is Jordan. And then she pointed to Israel and she said, this is Palestine. And so I was sitting there among a hundred other peers. And I knew that I had two options. I could either stay quiet and not say anything, or I could stand up for Israel. And so I decided to do the latter. And I raised my hand and I said, professor, that country that you just pointed to is Israel. And you're doing an injustice to your entire class, if you call it anything but that. And there was a pause. And she looked at me and she said, hmm, Aliza, you must be Jewish. That's the only reason you care about Israel. So as you can imagine, it was quite a difficult semester. I ended up bringing um, this incident all the way up to um, the administration and ultimately had the professor, um, she had to make a public apology in front of the lecture and had to be course corrected. So for a number of semesters following that incident, she would need to have her, her um, educational materials reviewed by um, numerous administration. And so, that to me was the moment that I understood my place within not just the Jewish community, but community at large and understanding that if I wasn't the one to stand up and speak up for Israel in that moment, no one was going to. And the 100 other students that were in the lecture hall with me were going to leave class that day and just say, oh, yeah, that 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 country is Palestine. And so when they start to learn more and start to hear more on the media, they're, they're already coming from a place of thinking that they know and thinking that they have the education because a professor told them that. And so throughout my collegiate experience from there on out, I dedicate myself to learning as much as I could about Israel and doing all the internships, all the fellowships. And I ultimately um, became very connected with an organization called Stand With Us. I know that we have people from all across the country tonight, so I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Stand With Us. If you've been on social media over the past three months, I'm sure you've been seeing a lot of their educational materials. And so Stand With Us is an international national nonprofit organization that really embraces this concept of education. And they say the only way that we're going to change hearts and minds is by basing all of our work on, on the concept of education. And so upon graduation, I took a title as the New England Campus Coordinator, and I got sent up to Boston, where I'm where I'm calling from today. And so I was working with college students from across New England, and you know, prior to prior to this role, I thought I was a New Englander. I am from Connecticut. I enjoy apple picking and whatever, you know, the, the quintessential New England activities until I started working with some of these college students. And I realized I had a very different college experience. This was a time when BDS was really ramping up on campus and um, just in an effort to ensure I'm defining my terms, BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. And so this is an effort for anti-Israel groups on college campuses and beyond within the community as well to attempt to hurt Israel's economy by boycotting um, organizations and companies that are quote unquote funding the Israeli government and the IDF. And so ultimately these BDS resolutions that were proposed through student governments are never going to affect the Israeli government ever. However, the BDS campaigns that are proposed through student governments ultimately create this sense of uncomfort and um, a, a level of, of Risk, uh, of risk and um, safety for Jewish students on campus. They're seeing, you know, Israel is a baby killer. Israel's committing genocide. And now 
This was six years ago. So this isn't new language that we're hearing on the media today. This has been language that has been used for many, many, many years. And it's unfortunately not new on college campuses. So my role was working with the Israel, Israel groups on campus, as well as the Jewish organizations to be able to ensure that their students had the education and the confidence ultimately to be able to stand up for these for, for um, themselves and stand up against these anti-Israel groups on campus, such as Students for Justice in Palestine. SJP is an international organization and they have chapters on many campuses across the United United States. So when you're hearing about anti-Israel rhetoric on campus, much of it is coming from SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. And so I, I've been so fortunate to be able to work with thousands and thousands of college students and be able to give them the tools truly to stand up and speak out against Israel. And as we're seeing, the education piece is more important than ever. People have asked me for many years, where do I send my kids? Where should I tell my grandchildren to go when they're hearing about the BDS resolutions on campus or they're hearing about the anti-Israel groups making it an unsafe situation for Jewish students? I always tell them, send your kids to the toughest of climates. Because the minute that we're taking our students away, our Jewish students and their voices away from the table at NYU, Columbia, Harvard, UPenn, is the minute that we're going to lose the Jewish voice on campus and the minute that Israel will no longer have warriors on campus to be able to defend her. So as I became more involved in the Boston Jewish community, I quickly became very involved with Combined Jewish Philanthropies, with the, which is the Jewish Federation here in Boston. I took on the role as the campus engagement manager on our strategy and impact team and then have moved uh, in, over the past couple of years onto the development side of the house. And it's been really fascinating to see how an entire nonprofit organization works um, from the strategy and impact side to the development side of the house. So it's been really fascinating to grow in that capacity while, as David shared, simultaneously becoming um, involved in the sports arena as a New England Patriots cheerleader. So to take it back a couple of years, as I mentioned, I was on the UConn dance team and I've always loved performing. It's been a joy of mine to be able to be in front of audiences and make their experience, whether they're um, you know, at a basketball game or at a football game, to feel like they're really part of the action and to be that touch point. You know, many people won't meet um, the athletes on the field or the coaches or the owners, but there's opportunities to meet the cheerleaders and to be able to create that magic for them is something that's really special. So I became involved um, or I was exposed to the Patriots organization because of all the work, the incredible work that they do in our community, not just um, through a Jewish lens, but just how they're benefiting um, marginalized groups and, and groups in our community who need the most. Um, and so it's it, I was exposed to, to the Patriots Foundation and it became very clear just how perfectly aligned their values and their mission is to mine. And so when I auditioned for the team, I put in my cover letter in big, bold letters right on top, fighting anti-Semitism on and off the field. And so I said, if I had the honor and the privilege to become a part of this organization as a cheerleader, I didn't want to just be yet another you know, cheerleader on the sidelines, but I really wanted to utilize this platform to be that voice for other young Jewish individuals to be able to feel empowered um, and, and feel um, proud to be Jewish. And so throughout the past three seasons, I've been able to educate both in person on webinars and through social media to Jewish young people that need that role model, that need that voice and need someone to look up to and say, if that New England Patriots cheerleader is unapologetically Jewish, so can I. And if that Jewish Patriots cheerleader is supporting Israel, so can I. And that was really put to the test when I had the opportunity a couple months ago, at this point, a month, month ago, to travel to Israel just one month following the atrocious 
atrocious attacks by Hamas. So I received a phone call on a Wednesday afternoon from the World Jewish Congress. It's an organization that does a lot of incredible work bringing Jewish people from all across the globe together and, and bring them, you know, really bring them to, to areas in the world that the Jewish community needs us most. And of course, in the past two and a half months, the place that has needed us most is Israel. And so they were building a delegation of young leaders from all across the globe to go and visit Israel and to be on the ground just one month following the attacks. And so they asked, will you be a part of this delegation? And so, of course, what did I do? As any good Jewish daughter does, I gave a call to my dad. And I said, dad, is this absolutely crazy? You know, I'm, I'm my immediate answer. I want to say yes. I just, I, I'm not having too many doubts. So am I crazy that I'm not having these doubts? And of course he panicked for a few moments and it was less than two, three minutes later when he said, Eliza, you have to go right now. The Jewish people need you. The Jewish community needs you and Israel needs your voice. So you have to go. If you can go, you need to go. And so I then made a phone call to my coach because I was going to be leaving on a, on Saturday evening right after Shabbat. And that Sunday, I was expected to be at Gillette Stadium to be chairing at the Patriots versus Commanders game. And so I told my coach, I said, I have to be. I have to be in Israel. And she completely understood. And she gave me her blessing. And her one concern was my safety. She asked, will I be safe? And I said, you know, safety is, safety is a big question mark right now, but I will, I, I can't look back on this moment. And I've been saying this time after time again, every single decision that I've made since October 7th has gone back to this idea or this concept that I can't look back in this moment in history and question if I did absolutely everything I possibly could to support our community and to support Israel. And so I got on a plane on Saturday I, and I was in Israel for just over, uh, just over 72 hours. And it was an experience like no other. Life-changing doesn't quite encompass um, the experience that I had on the ground in Israel. We were in Tel Aviv, we were based in Tel Aviv, and we were meeting with um, high level um, IDF officers. We were meeting with families of hostages, uh, families of victims. We went down to Kafa Aza, which is a kibbutz in southern, um, on the southern border. In some parts of the community, we were only less than a kil uh, kilometer from the Gaza border. So we were hearing the we were hearing the rockets. Um, and it was really when walking through that community, walking to through Chabutz, Chabutz Kafaza is when it truly hit me just how horrific these attacks were. You can look on social media, you can hear it from the news, you can read articles, but nothing is like seeing it in person and and hearing it in person, hearing um, the sounds of, of blast shatter underneath your feet. But ultimately nothing prepared me for the smell. When I walked in to the kibbutz, there was a smell that can only be described as the smell of death. And I would love to share, I wrote a reflection um, following my my trip there about my experience in Kafa Aza. And I would love to share it with, with you all today. And I do just want to um, make note that there is some um, graphic language used. So I call this the smell of death in elementary. As we pulled into the entrance of Kibbutz Kafa Aza on the edge of the Gaza envelope, I asked myself, am I an invited guest? or am I invading the community? We stepped foot inside the kibbutz and we were dropped into a reality that nothing can prepare you for. No media coverage nor post on social media can fully describe the current state of the community. 
Houses and cars are completely burned, blackened, and charred. There are bullet holes through doors and walls. Furniture, clothing, and household belongings were among the rubble, covered in bloodstains. As I stood in these homes, again, I asked myself, am I an invited guest or am, am I inviting, invading the community? When Hamas terrorists came into these homes, they never asked themselves that question. Am I an invited guest or am I invading the community? As we walked through the community with each step, I felt and heard the crunch of broken glass and metal scraps under my feet. The pathways we were walking on were the same pathways that members of the community walked on to get home after the workday to see their family pre-October 7th. The same pathways that children would take to get to the playground and to their school pre-October 7th. The same pathways that survivors walked on after spending 35 hours in their safe rooms and the same pathways that the IDF asked survivors to close their eyes while walking on so they did not bear witness to the 60 lifeless bodies. 60 members of their community who fell victim to the barbaric acts of Hamas on October 7th. Something that can't be articulated through pictures or words is a smell that hit my nose from the moment we stepped foot in the kibbutz. It was a sharp stench that I will never be able to describe. A smell that can only be described as the smell of death. As we looked in the near distance, we could see Gaza. It's hard to imagine what life was like for the community members in Kibbutz Kafa Aza, being able to see your neighbor who has threatened your existence time after time again. I took a step back trying to bring my mind back to where my body was. And to my right, I saw a lemon tree. The tree was intact and bright, lemon, bright, bright yellow lemons were hanging from the branches. Lemons represent longevity, purification, love, and friendship. And in that exact moment, I needed to see that lemon tree. Leaving the kibbutz, our eyes were red and tearful. We were physically holding each other up, trying to make sense of what we had just witnessed. As we approached the exit, I saw a large Israeli flag waving in the wind. We were told that after the survivors were evacuated, the IDF went through each home and they hung up every single Israeli flag that they found. This flag had a prominent hole right under the Star of David. This flag couldn't be more representative of Israel and our Jewish community right now. There is a hole and we feel it every day, but we continue to stand strong and show our pride. In that moment, I answered my question. I was an invited guest and it is my responsibility to share both about the smell of death and the lemon tree. And so I wrote that reflection and I have a series of other reflections um, because when I was boarding the flight and on, the, and on the, 11 hour, the 11 hour flight to Israel, I had one fear and it truly wasn't about my safety and security, but it was about making sure that I told these stories and I shared the experiences and I did write by the Israelis that I was meeting on the ground. And so I'm looking forward to being able to share these reflections and continuing to share the stories of the Israelis that were most impacted. Because unfortunately, as we're seeing, people are either A, denying that these atrocities even happened, or B, saying, yes, they happen, but there's justifications. And there's absolutely no justi justifications for anything that happened on October 7th. And it's so important that we're continuing to share these stories to make people aware of why we need to, why we need to support Israel in every single thing that they're doing right now to protect Israel and to protect the Jewish community across the world. And so that was a lot that I just that I just shared with you. And I know that we want to leave some time for questions. And so I invite you to ask any question you may have about my experience as a Jewish athlete, about my experience in Israel, about my um, 
time working, my experience working with college students. I know that many of you have you know, children or grandchildren that are either college aged or looking, you know, it's, it's that time of, of the year that people are, are looking at, at campuses as seniors in high school. And so if there's any questions that you may have, I'm happy to answer it uh, here, here in our conversation right now. Wow. You know, first of all, I have to tell you that we've been doing these sports webinars for three and a half years now, and we've never had over 100 people. And right now you're speaking to 102 people from across North America. And your story, first of all, I will tell you personally, you hit on so many, so many high notes, so poignant. It's so meaningful, I think, to everyone on this call that I think we're all just just speechless. I can tell you personally, I work at Harvard Square. This end of the summer, I stayed across the street from Stand With Us, and I actually went to the office. And what you just said about Harvard is, is, is so, so, so important because it's not just Harvard, it's University of Pennsylvania. It's quite like what you just said. And if we stop going there, they win. I, I, I never heard that before, to be honest. And I follow this 24 seven. So your words and, and you know, knowing Mr. Kraft and all the great work they do. I mean, you didn't even touch upon that you were Miss Connecticut. You talked about Israel, you talked about your Jewish pride. We're all prideful. You have your third grade teacher on this call. I don't know if you've caught that in the chat. You have people from Connecticut in, from your hometown on this call. There is so much love and pride right now that is permeating throughout this call that I can tell you that we're all, and it's hard for me to be speechless and I'm almost speechless. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your words. They were beyond inspiring, beyond. So. Yeshikov, you, you are you are someone that we're all so proud of. So I'm going to open this. Up. Dan, uh, Danny, before you, um, Danny, before you do that, can I just say one thing? You know, if we were in a room and you were speaking, we'd all stand up and give you a standing ovation because this was absolutely phenomenal. I'll do the questions. <laughs> And by the way, one of our immediate one of our media past presidents, Stan, was uh, in Israel at the same time as you. So uh, wow. um, I'm sure he's feeling this very much. So I have just a reading the notes anyone have any questions? I have I have a question. Um, I'm from Worcester. I, 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 I'd like to know when you are out in, in the public and, and visiting colleges and stuff or even high school, how, how would you respond to a class where, where, where that's, or people, a group of kids that are predominantly Jewish and, and, they're, they're, and they're afraid? You know, they've been advised not to wear yarmulke, yarmulkes in public and not to show that they're Jewish and so forth and so on. And, and be careful in school because they may be, let's say they're not... Uh, they're not ultra liberals. They may be conservative or, um, you know, or uh, independent or whatever. And they're not, they can't, they're, they're just afraid they're going to be attacked by people who they thought were their classmates or they were uh, friends, but now they're not so sure. What do you tell them? How do you advise them? So, Alan, I've gotten that question far too many times from parents that have actually had this happen to, to their children where, they feel afraid. And first and foremost, I want to say whether you're a kid or a kid at heart, as many of us are on the screen, it's okay to be afraid right now. There is real reason for us all as, as Jewish individuals, whether you wear your Jewish pride on your sleeve or not, to be afraid of what's happening right now. Not just what's happening thousands and thousands of miles away in the Middle East, but what's happening right here in our own community. I know this Sunday alone, um, there were hundreds of Jewish institutions that received um, bomb threats. That's right here, hundreds right here in the greater Boston community. 
And so that fear is real. And I think first and foremost, we need to talk about the acceptance of this fear with, with young people in a way that we're empathizing with them, but telling them that the only reason that the Jewish community has been able to not only survive, but thrive after centuries of different groups trying to destroy us and trying to make us so scared that we just run into, you know, run into a, a, a space where we're not going to show our Jewish pride or, or just say, okay, I'm Jewish, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shout it from the rooftops or I'm not gonna you know, celebrate the holidays, or I'm not going to, um, you know, continue to build upon the thriving community that the Jewish community has built. Um, and so we need to, we need to be sharing those stories of how the Jewish people have continued to be threatened for years and years, but the best and the only way that we are able to get through these really challenging situations in these challenging times is by leaning in we have seen more young people than ever before. And when I'm saying young people, I mean middle school age, high school, ca campus, young adult, leaning into their Jewish community. And so as, as individuals that, that are connected, I mean, you are all connected to your, com your community in some capacity. It is really our due diligence to ensure that there are enough opportunities for engagement. And whether you are the person that, that is at the forefront of ensuring that there is opportunities for engagement, or you're providing your, your own talents or your treasures, you know, as we say in the, in the uh, nonprofit Jewish space, you know, you can provide your, your talents or your treasures or your time. And so, it's so in, it, essential right now that we're finding ways to and creating spaces for young people to lean in to their Jewish uh, community. And so I think to to, to answer your, your question, uh, to summarize, say it's OK. It's OK to be fearful right now. There's no reason to be fearful, but lean in and find the ways that you can connect with other Jewish individuals that are experiencing what you're experiencing right now. And let's figure out how we work through this together. So we have we have several questions in the chat. Um, and one of them um, is a good segue from what you were just talking about as far as Jewish pride. But the question is this, have you had an experience with Jewish voice for peace? And if so, what, what are your thoughts? How do we, these, these are Jewish, and just, I'm sure most people know this, but so these are Jewish people that think that uh, there should be an immediate ceasefire and that Israel, they're not Zionists. And they're, uh, so there, there's Jews that have a different a different perspective on um, what you were just talking about for the last 40 minutes. And and so what's been your experience and how do you deal with that? It's And it's, it's young people mostly. So when I first started working with the New England campuses, uh, specifically Harvard, Brown, Tufts, there were a number of Jewish students that were active in their Hillel, that were active in their Chabad, and they were also active with SJP, so the anti-Israel group, Students for Justice in Palestine. And I could not wrap my head around this. This was really the first time I was meeting and engaging with young Jewish individuals that were not only saying, mm, I'm not too sure, I'm not quite educated on this, so I don't necessarily want to like push myself into the, the space of being um, a loud and proud Zionist, but they were actually going to the far extreme and saying, I'm Jewish and I'm anti-Israel. And you know, I, I spoke with my my longtime mentor about like how do I how do I engage with these students? You know, I'm supposed to be in a space where I'm creating a thriving environment for all Jewish students. I, I don't I just don't get it. I truly was just dumbfounded at the the idea of a young Jewish person that. And, and not just young, any Jewish person that 
could say, I'm Jewish and I'm anti-Israel. And for me, what I had to finally, like through just like trying to make sense of this, the only the only place I could get to is that they just didn't have the right educators in their life. And it's not too late. It's not too late for anyone to receive the education unless they've said, these are, these are my viewpoints and I'm never changing. In the education space, we have this concept called 10-80-10. Now, I'm, I'm, we've been saying it for many years. I'd be curious if we did a, a pulse check today of what that what this would look like, but 10% of any, you know, demographic you're working with, let's say we're just working with the population at Harvard, 10% already, they're in your, your camp. They're the, you know, Jewish students that are proud Zionists, they're proud to support Israel. They understand the importance of, of engaging with the Jewish community, of speaking out for Israel. And that might, there may be varying levels within that 10% of how active engaged they are, how equipped they feel they are to have difficult conversations, but they're they're proud Zionists. You then have the 10% that have already made up their mind that they are anti-Israel, regardless of the educational opportunities, regardless of what um, you know resources may be available, regardless of who they speak to. They're not flipping the script. They are, they've decided that they are anti-Israel and that is that. And then you have the 80%. The 80% is the population that are either uneducated, and I, I say this in a very kind way, but they're uneducated. They haven't quite had the tools, the resources, the education made available for them to learn why as Jews we need to be supportive of Israel and vocal about our support of Israel, or they're just apathetic. They just, you know, have had other things, whether it's athletics or their scholastics they just have chosen to not care for whatever reason and so in in a, in the mind of an educator of course we want to be educated in the 10 percent that have chosen they want to support israel because we want to continue to empower them to um you know feel feel equipped to have difficult conversations but the 80 percent is really our target target audience and the target uh, students that we want to cater our educational resources to, that 10%, they're not going to change their minds. And when I'm asked about Jewish Voices for Peace, when I'm asked about JVP, I put them in that 10%. To me, it is not worth my time to try to be educating them, truly. They are putting on t-shirts and they're standing in front of the state capitol here in Boston. They're standing on highways. They're standing in front of the White House saying, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish and I don't support Israel and whatever verbiage they want to use that day. To me, they're not worth my time as an educator because I can use that same amount of time educating that 80% and bringing them closer to the, the camp of understanding why we need to support Israel. And so unfortunately, I don't, I, I don't think that we're going to see a decrease in the number of Jewish individuals that are so vocal about their lack of support for Israel. Um, I, I, I foresee that number actually growing in the next few years. And it's going to be really unfortunate um, to be able to be able to have other anti-Israel groups latch on to this idea of having Jewish um, individuals representing our community. And, um, you know, this this idea of tokenization is, is really prominent when they're able to see a loud Jewish person that's so, um, so loud in their their um, lack of support for Israel. So unfortunately, I think that that group is going to continue growing, but we need to channel our energy and our resources to that other 90%, that 10% that's already ready and willing and just needs to continue to be nurtured. And that that 80% that, that have, haven't quite had um, the resources made available to them yet. Danny, can I ask a follow-up question? Okay. Sure. First of all, outstanding. I mean, I, I'm, I'm 
there's a lot of hope that you've given us that there are people who are younger than many of us on this call who are going to carry on what we've worked on so hard for our lives. So I, I thank you very much for that. Th there's now a group of students, young people, not they're, they're post students who went to day school, who went to Camp Ramah, who had multiple Israel experiences, who are now saying, you've lied to us. 123 graduates of the Charles E. Smith Day School in, in, in Maryland sent a letter this week or uh, yeah, a couple, yesterday basically proclaiming that I have a niece who says that, who says, you know, you lie, you didn't talk about the Palestinians and therefore, and, and they've become like diehard now anti-Israel. What can we do with them, if anything? The education around Israel and around the Middle East as a whole needs to start much, much earlier than it has been over the past, I would say, two, three decades. Um, you know, people ask me, why, like, why are you like you're in that age demographic where like there are plenty of people my age that are they're having those same conversations and having those same questions and saying, you know, my my educators, my teachers, my parents, my family, they lied to me. Um and I will say, I mean, as I have, as I have my former educators on the call, like I was, I was told that like Israel is always that home for us. And that is the thing that like brought me into this space of caring so much about Israel. And so I'm so grateful that like that basis of like Israel is your home, like Israel is your homeland, um, started from a young age, but I will say that the educational piece about the Middle East as a whole isn't started until, unfortunately, it's too late. And why I'm saying that and why I think that there's been such a shift is because with the rise of social media and the emphasis on, um, you know, how, how information is shared um, from people that quite frankly, are not in a place where they should be educating, that's where these young people are getting their first exposure. And so we need, as a community, we need to, to flip the script. And we need to be starting from, I would say, elementary school to be sharing more comprehensively about the history of the Middle East. And when you really go back the 3,000 years, it's pretty clear why Israel is the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. But we also need to be sharing other narratives to ensure that Jewish students aren't getting on TikTok or getting to a college campus and hearing those narratives shared from people that aren't going to be um, sharing the complete story. And so I've always said that if you're starting from a place of like, where do I even start in having these conversations with young people? One of my favorite books um, is Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor by Yossi Klein Halevi. I think that is a really beautiful um, first start in getting, you know, hearing like what are the, what are the parts of the Palestinian narrative that I need to be learning about? And I also say, and I really encourage all of you, that the best way to equip yourself to have difficult conversations and to have dialogue with nuance is to actually be reading Palestinian and Arab sources. I started when I was taking those Middle East studies courses, I realized that the only way that I was going to be able to um, be successful in challenging conversations around Israel about, um, you know, our, the Arab neighbors is if I was actually reading the sources that the, you know, other person in that conversation was reading, because then I was able to read through these sources, read through the information, go back to the other sources that are maybe more easily accessible here in our, you know, the Israel pro- uh, pro-Israel Jewish community and be able to find how can I take what they're going to say and have the credibility and the the information to be able to to go against the statements that they're making. So I always say that, you know, when people ask like, why are, why are you so fearless in conversations with, you know, pro-Hamas groups or supporters? And I say, because I read Al Jazeera 
just as frequently as I read Times of Israel. And I think that's the key component in making sure that our young people are not only feeling um, that we're giving them the full story, but they feel equipped to have conversations that are very difficult down the line. Thank you for that. So we want to respect your time, but there is a overarching question here. It's coming up over and over again. You are a cheerleader for the New England Patriots. And we do, even though we are throughout North America today, we do have several uh, of us that are ardent New England Patriots fans. And there's a lot of interest in your experience with anti-Semitism. Have you experienced, now we know Mr. Kraft is the owner, so we know that that's a big deal, but have you ever experienced it with your fellow cheerleaders? Have you experienced it in the NFL? And another question related to that is what can be done so the NFL take, we know Mr. Kraft takes a very strong stand. Oh, I think they cut out right at the end. Uh, well, so, uh, yeah, it sounds like Danny just dropped off. Um, so I'll, I'll finish his. his he's, one of, he's one of the only. Oh, and he's back. Uh, Danny, the uh, Yeah, sorry. Danny, why don't you pause for one second, Eliza? Why don't you uh, start with the first question? The uh, dealing with the in, in your experience, in your life. I think I'll start with the first and the part. Second question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Danny, yeah. we, we... Jump right, in with the first, first part of the question, question. and Go then ahead. perfect. So I'm so fortunate, truly so incredibly fortunate to be able to work side by side with the Kraft family from my very first a uh, couple weeks on the team. It was within the first month that I became a New England Patriots cheerleader. I was sitting down with the team at the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism, which is Mr. Robert Kraft's um, foundation that he created after winning the Genesis Prize. And he said, you know, we need to be using our our the, the sports arena to be able to have difficult conversations. I saw a couple of comments about, you know, how, how are we using, um, you know, athletes in the professional um, athletic world to be having anti-hate anti um, related conversations. And so in that first, that very first meeting, I was sitting down, um, I, I was sitting down with the team and Josh, one of the, the sons, he was like, have you met my father? And I was like, no, I haven't met Mr. Robert Croft, the owner of the New England Patriots. And so oh, come on, let me go get him. So he brings him down to the conference room that we were in. And it was such a beautiful conversation that we were able to have sharing about our, our pride as, as Jewish community members, you know, shared, we shared about, you know, why, like why we're so passionate about educating about Israel and fighting against anti-Semitism. And so from that very first conversation, it became very, very clear to me that the Kraft family not only were in complete alignment with my work and with my mission, but that I really owed them, you know, if I was going to be a goodwill ambassador for their organization, I needed to do everything in my power to ensure that I was utilizing my platform and utilizing every single conversation I was having, whether it was with my fellow cheerleaders or in spaces, you know, outside of, of the stadium in the community, being able to bring this messaging along with me. And so over the past three years, um, I've been able to see, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to see on the screen, but I've been able to see their Stand Up the Jewish Hate Initiative come to life. And so this initiative was started, was launched this past uh, last spring, so like March of 2023. And it's been so incredible to be able to watch as other sports organizations, professional sports organizations, including the NBA, other teams in the NFL, NASCAR, WWE, take 
not only learn, but take on um, the educational and advocacy aspects of the Stand Up to Jewish Hate campaign. And so it's been a privilege to be a part of um, this, this convening of sports leaders from across the industry and serve as a representative of the New England Patriots. And so I've been really fortunate. My teammates have um, you know, over the over the past three seasons have been really supportive of my role as an educator. Um, I'm the only Jewish Patriots cheerleader. There have been others throughout history. And it's been really cool as I've become this, um, you know, very vocal uh, Jewish cheerleader. I've heard from uh alumni of the organization that are, are, are also Jewish. And, um, you know, they're so, they're so proud. They're so proud to see that the organization has opened my, uh, you know, have, has been receptive of my, um, you know, my passions. And so it's really a privilege to be able to build upon this legacy. And, you know, as, as any public figure, anyone that puts themselves out there and, um, you know, whether, whether it's about being Jewish or supporting Israel or whatever, unfortunately controversial stance that they take, um, you know, you, you are putting yourselves up for, for criticism and for hate. And I am no stranger to it. Um, over the past year or so, I have definitely been, uh, on the receiving end of, Plenty of anti-Semitic comments um, over the over a year ago was um, when the, the Patriots put out one of the first like articles about my work in the Jewish space. And there was just hundreds and hundreds of comments, um, you know, anti-Semitic to its core. Um, one called me a, a Jewish Jewish rat face. And I unfortunately like. I just feel bad. Like, I just feel bad for those individuals that have so much hatred and like this Jewish rat face is only feeling more empowered to, to speak up for our community. So he didn't do what he wanted to in, in silencing me. He only made me feel stronger and more empowered. So I'm no stranger to it. And of course, with everything that I put online, educating about Israel and advocating for Israel, um, I saw a, a very um, big uptick in the amount of anti-Semitic comments that were um, being directed to me on my public um, Instagram and TikTok account. And so it really was an eye-opening moment that, you know, with every, um, you know, with every stance that you take, people are going to say negative things, but no comment and no criticism is ever going to stop me from supporting Israel. Thank you. Danny, are you back? Hopefully, maybe. Where do you go? All right. Um, well, there's a question I saw of some of the Q&A, which says, um, what has been your perspective on how players and cheerleaders have responded to Israel post uh, October 7th? All right. Can you repeat the question? I'll try. I hope you can hear me when I have to go to a different screen. But uh, um what has been your perspective or what's your perspective on how players and cheerleaders have responded to Israel post October 7th? To be honest, I, I wish that I saw more professional athletes using their platform following the atrocities on October 7th to condemn Hamas's attacks. And as you know, we've continued to see violence and atrocities and an unfortunate and increased amount of deaths in, in Gaza. You know, I think that people, unfortunately, don't feel like they have the tools to be able to speak out. And this isn't acceptable. We need as as organizations that are leading the charge in ensuring that young people have the tools, they need to be able to see their role models, the athletes on, um, you know, sports teams doing, doing the same and using their platform to speak out. And so I think that it starts from, it starts from the top down of how are the owners, do they have the tools, do they have the resources to be able to speak out and speak boldly about atrocities and anti-hate campaigns? And then it starts from there you know, from the ownership, how do the players, you know, do they have the tools? Because then ultimately 
young people are going to see, um, you know, these these role models that they look up to doing what we're telling them, you know, to do. So it's it's important, though, that it's coming from a place of, um, you know, genuine, genuine interest and genuine um, care rather than just being fed talking points from ownership. So it's it's going to be a long game and ensuring that, you know, these these figures, these role models are speaking out when atrocities happen across the globe, but it needs to be something that is done in a genuine manner. Thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back. over to David now. David. Okay, thank you. So um we've done many, many sports webinars and I don't know <laughs> if anybody everybody knows. I never really have met anybody on these webinars and, and personally Okay, never. So we reach out to them. We never really, we hope for the best. And whatever it happens, it happens. Okay. Fortunately, it has been really, it has been phenomenal. You are unbelievable. This is absolutely maybe the highest attended sports webinar we've ever had. Uh, we have over 100 people. Um, you're just, uh, your intelligence, I mean, your outlook on life is just phenomenal um it gives us great hope as older jewish men and women that yeah. we have somebody like you who is like a role model and you are i think you're a definite role model for um young jewish ladies and i think that you know i know that i feel much better talking to you because now i feel a whole lot better so it has really been absolutely phenomenal um so let me just uh before i end it off quickly i just want to thank danny mando my coach here who always, he works with me and always gets me pumped up and uh, Stan Greenspan and Creighton Cone because they are our IT guys because I have no clue what I'm doing as we all as, as everybody knows. Um, Very true. Uh, yep. True. So anyway, I just wanted just want I'm not even going to talk about anything else besides that. I just want to thank you so much for being on tonight. Um, the response for this program has been absolutely unbelievable. I mean, we could go on for hours on this. this Actually, is he incredible. really wants to adopt you as a granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> and this, and this, this, uh, this usually just just doesn't happen. So, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. I know you're busy. I know, you know, just getting you to do this has been has been difficult because you're pro because you're so busy and your life is just not like people that we actually know in our lives. So, for, so this is just amazing. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us tonight. And we, as members of F Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. And please feel free if there's any questions that we weren't able to answer or you have um, individual questions, um, feel free, David, to share my email address and I'd be happy sure. to connect further. I have thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Uh, I'm so your